So we're going to proclaim now John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Amen. Amen. Now, we have been talking about holiness. I feel we've only just touched the margin of a vast ocean, but we have at least got to the margin. And in my final talk this evening, my theme is that when you come in contact or become aware of or have a revelation of the holiness of God, there is only one appropriate response, and that is worship. Mm -hmm. Worship is the uh, response to God's holiness. And without a revelation of God's holiness, really, we cannot have worship. Mm -hmm. We can have a song service, but we do not enter into worship until we have a revelation, however inadequate it may be, of the holiness of God. And the holiness of God is not explained, it can't be defined, it can only be revealed. And there are two passages in the scripture, one in the Old Testament, one in the New, where the word holy is applied three times to the Lord. No other adjective is applied three times to the Lord. It is unique. And in each case, the person who became aware of it received it by revelation. I want to read first of all the passage in Isaiah chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Isaiah 6, beginning at verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and set with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, your sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. That master passage is very meaningful for me because the first time I went to a Pentecostal service, and I'd never been in such a thing before, uh, and I was coming from a background of philosophy, I had this one question. Does he really know what he's talking about? And he took this text that I've read, and when he got to the words, I am a man of unclean lips, dwelling in the midst of a people of unclean lips, something said to me, no one ever described you more accurately than that. <laughs> because I was a soldier in the British Army, and I don't think there can be any group of men anywhere that better fit the description of of a people of unclean lips. And I was just as unclean as any of them. So after that, he had my attention. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize, I didn't know what he was talking about, but I realized he did. Mm -hmm. And that was the door that opened to me to bring me into salvation. Yeah. Um, I feel God wants to give me, to give this personal testament. I didn't intend to do it, but... Um, the preacher had previously been a taxi driver which is different from the kind of people I listen to at Cambridge <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And um, although he started from this text, he didn't stick with it. He was one of those preachers who moved up and down from the Old Testament to the New and back again. And I found him hard to follow. But I got, he got to a place where he was talking about David the shepherd boy and his relationship with King Saul. And he was conducting an imaginary dialogue between King Saul and David. And he very rightly emphasized the fact that King Saul was head and shoulders taller than the rest of the people. So in his dialogue, when he was speaking as King Saul, he jumped up on a little platform, uh, a little uh, bench, and looked down at where he'd been when he was speaking to David. And I was following this with some interest, but in the midst of an impassioned speech from the bench as King Saul, the bench collapsed and he, <laughs> and he fell to the floor with a loud thud. Well, if you had been planning to prepare something suitable for a Don from Cambridge, you would have left that part out. <laughs> but the thing is, in spite of everything, not because of everything, but in spite of everything, I knew he did know what he was talking about. Furthermore, I knew I didn't. Well, they got to the end of this strange performance. <laughs> and uh, then they had every head bowed, every eye closed. I'd never been in a church where people did that. And then, if you want this thing, whatever it was, put your hand up. And they had no background music, nothing, just complete silence. And I sat there in what seemed a very long silence. And there were two voices, inaudible voices, speaking in each ear. And one said, if you put your hand up in front of these old ladies, and you're a soldier in uniform, you're going to look very silly. The other one said, if this is something good, why shouldn't you have it? Mm -hmm. And I was paralyzed, I could not respond. And then a miracle took place, a real miracle. I saw my own right arm go right up in the air, and I knew I had not raised it. <laughs> and I was really frightened. I thought, what have I got myself into? <laughs> well, that was all they were waiting for. Just <laughs> the moment my arm went up, everything started moving again. <laughs> I didn't receive any counseling from the pastor, but a very kind elderly couple who kept a boarding house near the church invited my fellow soldier and me home for supper. And that was a very tempting invitation in the army. So we walked back together with them, and this little lady of about 60 was telling me her experiences. And she described how her husband had been exempted from military service in World War I because he had tuberculosis. And I, I knew if it gained him exemption, it must be a valid medical diagnosis. And then she said to me, I prayed every day for 10 years for God to heal my husband. And I thought to myself, this is a dimension I have never even thought of. To pray every day for 10 years for something. Then she said, I was in the parlor praying. My husband was in the bedroom, sitting up in bed, spitting up blood. And she said, I heard a voice say, claim it. And I answered, Lord, I claim it now. And at that moment, her husband was completely healed in the bedroom. Well, I said to myself, maybe this is what I've been looking for. So that was my introduction to Pentecost. Now, let's go back to Isaiah 6. It says, he saw the throne and one who sat on it, and above it stood the seraphim. Now, im is the Hebrew plural, so they were seraphs, if you want to put it in English. The word seraph is directly connected with the word for fire. In modern Hebrew, a strefa is a fire. And uh, so these were fiery creatures, and each one had six wings. And they were crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Hmm. And to me, there's something about holiness that is fiery. Hmm. I'm very interested in things like this. The seraphim had six wings. On the other hand, the cherubim that are spoken about in Ezekiel chapter 1 and elsewhere had four wings. Now, the seraphim 
overshadowed the throne of God. The cherubim, the, the cherubs, were his, what would I say, his transportation. He traveled on cherubs. Wherever they went, he went. Wherever he went, they went. And it's interesting, I don't, didn't intend to get into this, but I'm, when I'm interested in something, I can. The, the word keru in modern Hebrew means a cabbage. And I always ask myself, well, how come that the word for cabbage was applied to the cherubs? And I believe myself, this is my belief, it's because their wings came out from the body in the way and the leaves of a cabbage come out from the stalk. So, I find them extremely interesting. Now, the behavior of the seraphim was noteworthy. Each of them had six wings. They used two to cover their faces, two to cover their feet, and two to fly with. Now, covering your face and covering your feet is worship. Mm. Worship is always a posture of the body, mm. wherever you go in Scripture. Mm. And so, they used four wings for worship, two wings for service. That's the proportion in heaven. I believe it should be the same on earth. I believe we should give twice as much to worship as we give to service. And when we do that, our service will be altogether different. So that's the Old Testament picture. But I want to emphasize the covering of their faces and the covering of their feet was worship. And I will show you briefly, a little later, that every word in the Bible for worship describes the posture of the body. There is no such thing as inanimate worship. It's really a contradiction in terms. Worship is our response to the holiness of God. And if we have no vision of holiness, we cannot worship. All we can have is a song service. Yes, that's right. And basically, that's all that most people have in yes. most parts of the world today, mm. with some wonderful exceptions, mm. is a nice song service. Well, that's all right. There's nothing sinful about a wrong service, but it's a great mistake to call it worship. Mm. Now we turn to the New Testament. And again, the only word that's applied three times to the Lord is the word holy. I love the book of Revelation. At one time I said to Ruth, I just don't understand the book of Revelation. I don't get much out of it. Let's read it right through. So we did. Then I said, well, I still didn't get much out of it. Let's read it right through again. And we did. The third time, the penny dropped, as they used to say. You don't even understand that, do you? <laughs> you do. I'm, I mean, something opened up to me. And if I had to choose what passages I'd like to read many, many times, I'd choose Revelation 4 and 5. Because this is a scene of worship yes, in yes, heaven. Amen. Let's read it. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven. The first thing he saw was a throne. Then, when his eyes had adjusted to the throne, he could see the person who was sitting on the throne. Now, Ruth and I counted just the other day, I think, how many times the word throne occurs in the 11 verses of chapter 4? It's 14 times. Mm. So this is the throne room of God. This is the place from which the universe is governed. And what goes on in it? Worship. It's out of worship that the universe is governed. Let's look at what the, the living creatures, they're not called either seraphim or cherubim in this place. 
Well, let me read a little bit. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and on the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. That's the last visible presentation of the Holy Spirit. And it's seven lamps of fire. Hmm. In uh, Hebrews it says, our God is a consuming fire. Mm -hmm. Not is like a consuming fire, but is a consuming fire. That's not God the Father. That's not God the Son. That's God the Holy Spirit. He is a consuming fire. Mm -hmm. And when the fire fell at the sacrifice of Elijah on Mount Carmel, the whole people fell flat on their faces, shouting, the Lord, he is the God. Mm -hmm. They fell on their faces because they were not present before a spiritual manifestation. Mm -hmm. They were present before God himself, the third person of the Godhead, the one who is a living flame of fire. Mm -hmm. And then, Verse 6, before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. We really don't know whether these are the same seraphim that are mentioned. And the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and for your will, or because you wanted them, they exist and were created. You know, the best reason for anything being the way it is, is that's the way God wants it. And so they were there because God wanted them there. When you've come to that, that's the final reason. There's no further reason to look for so, how did they worship? They fell down before the throne. They had a revelation of the holiness of God. And I believe that's essential for us if we are to have true worship. It is a response to the holiness of God. No revelation of holiness, no worship. You can have a nice song service, you can have praise, but worship you cannot have without a revelation of holiness. Mm. And when we know the holiness of God in any measure whatever, the appropriate response is always worship. Mm. And in Psalm 29, verse 2, and elsewhere, it says, Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Holiness is spiritual beauty. It's not physical beauty, but spiritual beauty. And I have been amongst so many different kinds of Christians that I find that sometimes the people who outwardly have very little to commend them have more of holiness. Mm. I think of one or two Down Syndrome children that I've known. Mm. And in a way, they're simple. But when it comes to knowing God, mm. in their own way, they know him much better than most of us. They have the inner beauty mm. of holiness. Mm. And it often goes with outward problems, physical weakness, distortion. But if I had to choose, and God hasn't told me to choose, I'd rather have the inner beauty of holiness. Mm -hmm. 
than any kind of elegance or strength or power. I covet that beauty for others, for myself. 